Well, I think you'll find this a very interesting series. As usual, it's all about you. But I mean the true you. Your immortal self. Your true identity. Not the little garment that you wear, with which you are so identified that you think it to be yourself. No, I'm not speaking of that. I'm speaking of the true you. The being that has no beginning and will have no end. That's the being. Now, our textbook is reading the Bible. But biblical language evokes rather than describes. It is all about another world. And all about the sons of God who purposely, deliberately came down into this age and are now buried in humanity. And the plan devised before that the world was for their return, plus the experience, the feasting of death, for this is the world of death. So the plan is contained within you, the true you, and you are buried in the man you think you are, and you are not that man at all. It's only a garment, like a suit of clothes that you're wearing. Now tonight my subject is, I say you are God. This is taken from the 82nd Psalm. In 1888, Thomas King, who is the editor of a book that is still to say considered the most scholarly of all of the higher criticisms of the Bible, called the Encyclopedia Biblica. And he wrote, No song makes a stronger demand than this upon the historic imagination of the interpreter. The ideas may be perennial, but their outward forms are no longer understood. Now let me quote the passages that he could not understand. And to this day, if you take the historic imagination of man, treating the Bible as secular history, they all will flounder. Here it is. And God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And now he passes the judgment. I say you are God. Sons of the Most High. All of you. <clears throat> Nevertheless, you will die like men, and fall as one man, O Prince. But if you read it, this implies that those addressed were not men. Otherwise, the forecast that they would die like men would be meaningless. Now the New Testament tells us we are the ones addressed. <clears throat> so we turn to the 10th chapter of the book of John. And the central figure makes the claim, I and my father are one. And they took up stones to stone him. And he said to them, for which of my good works do you stone me? And they answered, for no good works but for blasphemy. For you, being a man, make yourself God. And then he say to them, Is it not written in your law, I say you are God? If he called them God, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated 
and say into the world that you blaspheme because I say I am the Son of God. There is one in whom the pattern awoke. And he gained the certainty that he was God. Only as the pattern awoke within him. And he tried to tell his brothers that we are the ones addressed in that 82nd Psalm. But they would not believe it. If you've ever seen anyone suffering from amnesia, and I have, it's almost impossible to describe it. <clears throat> you feel like crying. You look into the face of a friend that you know well, and he cannot remember you. You bring his closest friends, his parents, maybe he has a wife, his children, and he cannot recognize them. He does not know them at all, and he is not fooling. He cannot remember them. Complete amnesia. That's what has happened to us. We have completely forgotten who we are. And I am here to tell you that you are the Lord Jesus Christ. He is buried in you. And until the story of Christ repeats itself in you, he remains buried in you. That's the story. Now, how do I know? I know from my own personal experience. That's how I know. I am not theorizing. I am not speculating. When it happens in you, you can pick out a circle that will experience your unfold and know you to be the Lord. He will know it, she will know it, they will know it. And you do not have to pick out the day they'll know it. They will all know it. But everyone will know it. Or this is going to happen to every being in the world. Everyone. Now we are told, though he was in the form of God, he did not think it a thing to grasp, but emptied himself and became man, stood upon himself the form of a slave and was born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Well, the only cross on which Christ was ever crucified is the human form. This is his cross. And that I do know from experience. Every child born of woman is the cross on which Jesus Christ is crucified, in which he is buried, and from which he will rise, and ascend to where he was before his descent into this world. But the language used in Scripture evokes, it doesn't describe it. There is an attempt to describe it. The third chapter of John. He is now discussing with one of the Sanhedrin. Well, a member of the Sanhedrin is the most scholarly, the wisest of Israel, the great teacher, Nicodemus. He explains to Nicodemus that a man must be born again. Now, this is not reincarnation. It has nothing to do with reincarnation. You are now individualized. And you came forever and forever towards ever greater individualization. No such thing as reincarnation as thought 
by a very large section of the world and believed in it by a number million. That's not what he is teaching. You must be born again. But the word is anothen, which means from above. We are all born from below, from the womb of a woman. Everyone must be born from above, from the skull of man where God is buried. It's the birth of God. That's the birth from above. Now he said, no one ascends into heaven, but he who descended. Now he names it, the Son of Man. That which comes out of man, that is now buried in man. It cannot ascend, unless it first descended, it descended into man. When you spank the little child and it breathes, that's the breath of God, which is God himself in that child. For the word breath and the word spirit are one in both Hebrew and Greek. And he breathed into them, and they became living beings. But we are destined to be not only living beings, like automatons, we are destined to be life-giving spirits. For as the Father has life in himself, so he is given to the Son to have life in himself. By this act, of the crucifixion, crucified on this body, I will then rise and you will rise to exaltation to the Father. Not to see him as something other than yourself, but to be the Father. And you too will be able to say, I and the Father are one. Our descent into division and our resurrection into unity our descent into the generation of decay and death, and then our regeneration by our resurrection from the dead. <coughs> Blake paraphrased that statement of the 82nd Psalm in the most beautiful way. To those in great eternity met in the counsel of God as one man, for by contracting their exalted senses, they behold multitudes, as you and I do. For expanding, we behold one. One man. All the universal family contained in one. And that one man, we call, in the scripture, we call him Jesus the Christ. And they in him, and he in them, live in perfect harmony in Eden, the land of life. You are dwelling in every being in the world, or you couldn't even perceive them, and they all dwell in you. You are the being spoken of in Scripture as the Lord Jesus Christ. But until the story repeats itself in you, not as an observer, observing, but you, the actor, playing the part, the central part, not observing it as you would observe a theater unfolding before you, but actually the actor, the actor called Jesus Christ, without loss of your identity. You still maintain your own identity, and yet you are cast in the central role of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the imagery of scripture unfolds within you. And only then do you really know who you are. So I tell you tonight, you are the ones addressed in that 82nd Psalm that is still considered the most difficult of the 150 Psalms for the historic imagination of the interpreter to grasp. Yes, the ideas are perennial, they're forever and forever, and we read the work of Paul. Paul was determined not to know any Jesus Christ after the flesh, as he himself confessed in his second letter to the Corinthians. Henceforth I regard no one from the human point of view. 
Even though I once regarded Christ from the human point of view, I regard him thus no longer. He was determined not to conceive of this cosmic being from some little single man in this world. He is buried in humanity. And yet he is not divided. He is a total. He is one. And because he is buried in you, and you're not divided, you are one. And when you awaken, you'll see the whole vast world as yourself pushed out. Every being in your world lives within you. And that all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your own wonderful human imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. And that human imagination is the divine body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ is your own true identity. So when they say, we crucify you, no, we do not crucify you. We stone you, no, not for good works. We stone you for blasphemy. It's going to happen to you. When you dare to tell your vision, even to your most intimate friends, they will think you insane. If they should spread the news that you have actually experienced within yourself the entire story of Jesus as described in Scripture, they will begin to think that man is insane. And they said, why listen to him? He has a devil and is mad. Read it in the Gospel of John. Why listen to him? Any man who has gains the certainty from the experiences within himself which parallels the story in Scripture. If he tells it, I think he's insane. For man has been taught to believe in some little, tiny, physical, flesh and blood man that is called Jesus. And the word Jesus means Jehovah. The same word is Jehovah. It is the Lord God, the Savior of the world. But he is buried in man. In every man. Not a chosen little crowd, but every man. You want to know his name? His name is I Am. You can't go any place and not know that you are. You may forget this very moment and suffer total amnesia concerning your present physical state and not know who you are, where you are, or even what you are. But you can't forget that you are. No man can be unaware that he is. He can be unaware of who he is and what he is and where he is. But he can't be unaware of being. And that is the name of God forever and forever. So my name is in them, we are told. And because of that, you are immortal. So we are the sons who came down. Not because we did anything that was wrong. It's not a fault. I was taught from the pulpits of the world. This was a deliberate descent into this world of death and decay. To prove our own creative power that we could die, literally die, not pretend that we are men. If you are a God pretending that you are a man, you would know who you are and it could not do anything for you. You had to completely empty yourself of all that you are, your wonderful divine form, your heavenly rank, and actually come down and suffer total amnesia, and believe that you are a man to experience death, for all men die. So I say you are God, sons of the Most High, all of them. Nevertheless, you will die. You will die like men. And fall as one man, O princess. One man who is God the Father, containing all, came down. And now, through the act of the crucifixion, we are now transformed 
And from the crucifixion we are exalted to the Father. So when you rise, you're not rising as the Son of God. You're rising as God the Father. And what is the Son then? If we're all then God the Father, and if he's a Father, then where is his Son? Humanity is transformed. And the whole of humanity is symbolized in the single youth called David. And David is the son of the father. You are the father of David. <coughs> you do not know it yet. But you will know it. When you see him, there is no uncertainty as to this relationship between you, God the father, and your son David. You might think the whole thing is a legend. Well, it is. Man can fall in love with a legend. Israel fell in love with David. I mean David, the son of Jesse. And Jesse means Jehovah exists. He's the son of Jehovah who is. Any form of the verb to be, which is I am. And the day will come when you've completed the journey. He will stand before you and call you father. And you will know you are his father and he will know he is your son. There will be no uncertainty as to this relationship between you, God the father, and your son David, who is the essence of humanity. If you took all the generations of men and all of their experiences, and simply condense it into one single being and personify that being, it would come out as David. So having gone through the gamut, all that man could ever conceive of, and having played all the parts, then you come out. And when you come out, you are God the Father, and your son is David, the essence of all that you went through as man. And that is the story of the Bible. <clears throat> it cannot spell it out because how can you find words to describe it? I started to tell you earlier how he tried to tell it in the third of John. And when Nicodemus could not understand it, these are the words that he used. It's all beautiful imagery, but true. You find, you, if you can, a more beautiful image for one to use to express this expression. He said, as the Son of Man, speaking now, first of all, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And you will wonder, what on earth is he talking about? What can that do for me here? He's trying to explain how man ascends. But I tell you, having done it, I know how it's done. You cannot do it by taking thought. It just happens. In the fullness of time, it happens. And this is how it's done. First of all, you're told you are the temple of the living God. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. If I am the temple of the living God, and the Spirit of God dwells in me, and the curtain of that temple must be torn in two from top to bottom, it can only be a part of my body that is torn. It can't be a piece of cloth like that. Men think that some little curtain in the synagogue was torn has the thing to do with any curtain in the synagogue. If I am the temple, and the curtain is in the temple, there must be something in me that is torn in two from top to bottom, to reveal the holy of holies. Well, it is. Without any thought whatsoever, not knowing the moment is going to happen, not even know, knowing what's going to happen, the day will come that you will be torn in two from top to bottom. 
from the top of your head to the base of your spine. And they will separate two halves. And at the base of the spine you will see golden pulsing liquid light. As you're told, I am the light of the world. You'll see it. And you, the observer, will know you are what you are observing. That you're actually beholding yourself. It has no face. It's simply golden, golden, liquid light. And as you contemplate it, you fuse with it. And as you fuse with it, you become one with it, like a fiery serpent. Up you go. Up to that same body of yours into heaven. And heaven is not up there where the stars are. Heaven is within you. You go up into your skull and it reverberates like thunder. He ascends into heaven and you're told the kingdom of God is within you. So if I ascend into the kingdom of God, where can I go? But into myself, right into my own skull. So no one descends but he who ascends, and no one ascends, but he who descends. And then I saw what I am. That is the thing that came down into generation, at the base of my spine. When I fell into generation, and therefore decay and death, and now I behold it, and I fuse with it, and up I ascend like a fiery serpent. The imagery is perfect. How else could you describe it? So in the third chapter of John, he makes every attempt to explain what he means when he calls himself the Son of God, who is the Son of Man. It comes out of man, seemingly. But he redeems himself out of man. So man is not your true identity. God is your true identity. You are the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight you may want to throw something at me if you are trained differently. And think I am blaspheming. I am not blaspheming. I'm speaking the same words of the one recorded in the gospel. They said of him, you blaspheme because you being a man make yourself God. He knew he was not a man. For I cannot address things and say to them, You are the sons of God, sons of the Most High, all of them. Nevertheless, you will die like men. For if I were to die like a man, I cannot be a man when I was addressed. I'm something other than man. But he tells me what I was. You were the son of God. If I am the son of God, then I must be like God, whatever God is. And he isn't man. He comes down and he redeems man. But who came down? The sons of God. And all of us are the sons of God. And all of us together, not one must be missing, make up God the Father. <clears throat> and each, in his return, will be that God the Father. The totality. He will be the one God and Father of all. And he will have the one Son and that Son will be the sum total of all of the experiences of humanity. Fused into a single whole and personified and it's date as he stands before you. And he is just as he's described in the book of Samuel. An eternal youth. For eternity is not an old man. Eternity is personified as a youth. Eternal youth is my son. And he wears the form, yes. For I can tell you, the face is human, the voice is human, the hands are human, but do not ask me about the body. I could not describe the body. I have no image on earth to tell how someone could embrace me whose face is human, whose hands are human, whose voice is human when he asked me the question. And yet when he embraced me, our bodies became one. 
In this world of Caesar, one plus one equals two. In divine mathematics, one plus one equals one. He became one. So in the end, there's only one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. There will not be two of us. You and I are one. Because if you have the same son that I have, and you will, be fully conscious of it, then you and I must be one. And if we have the same son, then we are the same father. Yet without loss of individuality, without loss of our identity, I will know you in eternity, that I'll know you as God the Father, and know you as the one whose son is my son. And if your son is my son, then we are one. And this is the story of the Bible. Its language evokes, it does not describe. It does not describe things of this world. And all of our evangelists are trying to prove that they know from the Bible the world is coming to an end. And all this nonsense, the whole world is coming to any end. The age comes to an end to the individual. When the individual has completed the journey, and he finds himself unfolding within himself the entire story of the gospel of Jesus. And his world has come to an end. So when people call him dead, he is not restored to life in a world like this, where all people are. No. He is in a new age altogether. An entirely different age. Age called the kingdom of heaven. Which is a body. It's not a realm. Wherever he is now, clothed in that heavenly body, is heaven. For nothing can remain imperfect in his presence because he is perfect. Nothing can remain dead. He walks through the desert and it blossoms like a rose. He walks through a petrified forest and it bursts into foliage because he is life. He is the one true living being. And nothing can remain dead in his world because he is the living God. And those who die without the experience are instantly restored to life in a body that is human, just like this. Young, in a world terrestrial, just like this. To continue the journey until the story of Jesus is reenacted within him. When it's reenacted within him, he has come to the end of the age, which is what the world is speaking of today, of the world coming to an end. No world is coming to an end. And here you find all these things is almost embarrassing. I took a small ad in that Saturday's paper. When I saw these fantastic claims on the same page where my little ad appeared, I almost blushed. Come and see this multi-million altar made of gold and all the nonsense and all the silliness that you read all in the name of the Bible. And the Bible has nothing to do with this age. It's talking about you, the true you, not the little God that you shave in the morning. That is simply something that hides you. It hides the being that you really are. It's talking of your true essential being that deliberately came down and emptied himself of his divine right and took upon himself the form of a slave. Now listen to the word. He took upon himself the form of a slave and was born in the likeness of men. He equates slavery with men. And being found in human form, the three of them he equates, he identifies the three as the same. But a man may be like living in a fabulous world. He has homes all over the world. And maybe he can sign a check tonight and it will be honored tomorrow morning for $10 million without batting an eye. But he's a slave of the body that he wears. If he had all the money in the world, and if he had millions under his control, like any dictator of a fabulous land would have them under his control, 
to put them in slave in slavery with impunity. Yet the dictator who could make the order to execute that one without trial and that one, he cannot command one of his slaves to perform the natural functions of his body. He has to do it all for himself. He has to eat and drink. He has to assimilate what the body can assimilate and he has to expel from that body what it cannot assimilate and he has to do it all by himself. Isn't that a slave? These bodies enslave us. No matter who we are in this world, we drive through with our wonderful chariots and all the great police leading us and following us and the one waving to the crowd and maybe she is dying or he is dying to get beyond it because no one can do for her or for him what she has to do for herself and the time has come. Isn't that slavery? So being found in human form, then he called it a slave. He became obedient unto death, even death upon the cross. This is the only cross. And may I tell you, it's not a painful cross. When I experienced the crucifixion, it was the most ecstatic, the most wonderful feeling. They are vortices that nailed me there. Not pegs, as seen in pictures. How they arrived at those pictures, I do not know, because there is no description, no personal description of Jesus in the Bible. You cannot go through the 66 books and find one simple little personal description of Jesus. Yet we have all these paintings and all these things with nails made of wood or made of iron. If not, they are vortices. Here is a vortex. That's a vortex. A vortex. A vortex. And my two feet. Six vortices. And when they actually enter... It's sheer ecstasy. For you made the decision to give up your divine right and take upon yourself this garment. And the act of taking it was not a painful act at all. You deliberately did it and took upon yourself the form of a slave. And being found in human form, you became obedient unto death. Yes, the death on this cross. There is no other cause. In spite of all that has been said to the contrary, that they have a little piece of wood from the cross here, a little piece of wood there, if you took all the little pieces of wood together and put them together, it would build this house. And one man carried that cross. One has a little piece of cloth. This came from his robe. Another one, another church has a piece of cloth. Another church has a piece of cloth. Take all the cloths together that he wore as a robe, they would clothe an army. And yet people go blindly on, looking upon these little things, and bowing before it. it. Has nothing to do with it. As you are seated here tonight, no one is more holy than you are. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is buried within you. And you do not have to bow before anyone in this world. No one is more holy than you are. He may be richer, he may be stronger, he may be wiser, he may have all these qualities, and you do not possess them, but he is not any holier than you are. And in the end, when you awake, he cannot be any wiser. Because when you completely awake, you are the wisdom and the power of God as defined in Scripture. So don't think anyone on earth, regardless of his accomplishments, will transcend you. For that's the being of whom I speak and will continue to speak throughout the series. Or we will interlace it with what many would like to hear concerning the use of the law while we are waiting for redemption. How to use it wisely in this world and achieve certain objectives, certain goals in this world. That can be done. No question about it. Here in this audience tonight says the gentleman. The embodiment of the law. As he said to me, 
I go home, I sit in my garden, in my patio, and I dream, but a controlled dream. He worked in the city, Culver City. He did not have the educational qualifications for the job that was vacant. He had to have a college education to qualify. He did not have one. Went to high school and that was the last of his education. I saw the fall that came down from the powers that be. He is now, in spite of the so-called lack, which by law he had to fulfill, didn't fulfill it at all, did it all in his imagination. And now he is the purchasing agent of the city of Culver, Culver City. And that money is funneled through his hands every year. I asked him and he drove me down the other day, he took me downtown. I said, how much do you have to spend in the course of a year? We said, my budget runs about 800000 a year. It all comes through his fingers. Everything must come through his hands that the city needs. He has to okay. So here is a complete violation of the laws of Caesar. They'll all be violated if you apply the divine principle of imagination. If you know who you are, if you don't know who you are, well then, you're going to abide by all the little rules and regulations of the world. I had a friend of mine, and he always used to say, when I would remind him of a sign, look, it said, no so-and-so. He said, it didn't say it positively. <laughs> and so he went through life that way. It didn't say it positively. I said, see, there's a sign, only those who are boarding the plane can go down, not passengers. It didn't say it positively. He'd come aboard with me. I'm flying off to New York City, and here came Mort, and bringing a friend with him too. And I said, Mort, no smoking. No, no smoking. Didn't say it positively. <laughs> and he comes on down smoking his cigarette and bringing a friend aboard the plane to see me off. Not once, several times, but that was his favorite remark. It didn't say it positively. Well, in the law, as we will teach it to you through the weeks to come, for I'll be here every Monday and Friday until the 10th of December. And if you know exactly what you want and you dare to assume that you are what you want to be and that you have what you want and walk faithful to that assumption, though at the moment of your assumption your senses deny it and reason denies it, if you are faithful to it, it will harden into fact. Because the being that is doing it is within you. You assume this. That seemed an impossible thing for God to assume this little thing. But nothing is impossible to God. And he gave up his divine rank and assumed the human form. While in it, he is still God. He's forgotten that he's God. He can't pretend he is and play the part well. He has to actually believe that he is man. But he's not man. You are the being of whom the gospel speaks. You are that central character, Jesus Christ. Now then, let's go into the silence.